Hey guys, so up until this point, we've dealt with equilibrium questions that had a single support point, such as a bar that's held by a single rope. But now we're going to look into problems with multiple support points, and I'm going to go over a really important property of equilibrium questions, um, a really important technique you can use to solve these questions in an easier way. Let's check it out. All right, so when an object ha in equilibrium has multiple supports, such as here, you got two ropes, um, we can think of each support as a potential axis of rotation. I'm going to just write axis there. So you can think of this point as being an axis, and then this point as being an axis. One way to, to sort of visualize this is imagine that if you cut this rope here, the, the, the bar is going to spin around this point where the rope touches. Same thing as if you cut the rope here, um, the whole bar is going to spin this way um, around this point right there. Okay, so that's one way to sort of visualize that. Therefore, we can write that the sum of all torques equals zero for either one of those two points, for any support point. And in doing this, you're effectively treating it as the axis, even if it's not the axis, right? So if you don't cut it, they just stand, they stand there. There is essentially no axis of rotation because it's not rotating, but you still treat it as an axis. Meaning when you write your torque equation, remember torque equals FR sine of theta, and R is the distance to axis. In these cases, if you're writing the equation for this point, R will be the distance to this point. We'll do this. So I want to write here that the sum of all torques about a point P equals zero. And I could write this equation for this point one here, or I can write this equation for point two. So I can say sum of all torques about point one equals zero, and I can say sum of all torques about point two equals zero. Cool? You can do either one. Um, sometimes you have to write both equations. Sometimes you're, you're going to get away with writing just one of them. Okay? Now, what's even more important is that we can actually write sum of all torques about a point P equals zero for any point in this bar. Any point. Even if this point, um, even if the points are not the axis or support points. Okay? So let me show you. Um, there's two points of interest here, two additional points of interest. Um, there's this point here where little mg acts, and somewhere, let's say in the middle of the bar, there's a big mg. So let's call these points 3 and 4. So you could also write that the sum of all torques about point 3 equals 0, and the sum of all torques about point 4 equals 0, even though they are not um, supports. And you can go even one step further, and you can pick a random point that has nothing going on there. 0.5, nothing happens at 0.5. And you can say the sum of all torques at 0.5 equals 0. You can use any of these equations to solve this problem. Okay, Any of them will work. Now, since you can choose your reference axis, I'm calling this reference axis because it's not really an axis. You're just picking it and treating it as an axis um, while you're writing the equation. So since you can do this when you write your sum of all torques about a point P equals zero, okay, and you're going to write one or more of these, if you can pick, you want to pick the easier ones, the ones that are going to make your life simpler. It's going to make it easier to solve this question. Um, so how do we know which ones are the easiest? Well, you use the fact that forces acting on a, on an axis produce no torque. If a force acts on an axis, it produces no torque. So if one is my axis of rotation, this tension here will not produce a torque on point one, right? Um, which means when you write the equation, you're going to have fewer, um, fewer things on the equation, all right? Fewer terms. So what you want to do is you want to pick points with the most forces on it. There's a force acting on point one, so that's a good point. There's a force acting on point three, so that's a good choice. There's one force acting on point four, that's a good choice. There's one force acting on point two, there's a good choice. All of these points, one, two, three, and four, have exactly one force acting on them, so they're all equally good choices. Five is a bad choice, because there are no forces acting on it, so you can't cancel anything. So none of these points are better than the other, um, except five is, is, is for sure the worst one. So you want to pick points where there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of forces are acting there, so that the uh, equations you end up with will be simpler. Let's do an example. So we have a board, and this example is just describing the board up top. Um, a board six meters in length, 12 kilograms in mass. So what I want to do is I want to move 
um, this board down here. And I'm gonna put this little M here. All right, so the board has a length of six meters and it has 12 kilograms in mass, mass equals 12, has uniform mass distribution, is held by two light ropes, one on its left edge, so I'm gonna call this one, there's a tension one here, let's make it a different color, there's a tension one here, and the other one is one meter away from the right edge, so this is T2, and it is a distance one meter from the edge. Um, it says that an eight kilogram object is placed, so this mass here is eight kilograms, let's write little m equals eight, placed one meter from the left end, so this distance here is one meter. All right, and that's it. What else do we have? Uh, we have one more force, so we have little mg. We also have big mg that acts right in the middle right here. Big mg that happens in the middle, that's the, the mass of the, um, the weight of the bar. So the weight of the bar happens in the middle, that means that this is three meters, and this here is three meters as well. So this extra distance, one, this has to be a two, so that this whole thing is a three, and this has to be a two as well. So I have one, two, two, one, all right? Four forces, bunch of distances, we wanna calculate what is T1 and what is T2. First thing you can say is that the sum of all forces on the bar is zero. This is for the entire bar, so you can only write this equation once. This is for the y-axis, because there are no forces in the x-axis. Um, so this is just gonna be T1, um, T1 positive plus T2 positive plus Mg negative and big Mg negative as well. All of this equals zero. If I move the negatives to the right side, I end up with T1 plus T2 equals Mg plus big Mg. Um, this should make sense because all this is saying right here is that all the forces going up equal all the forces going down. I have the masses, I have G, but I don't have T1 or T2. Therefore, this equation is not enough. However, check it out. Um, once I know T1, I'll be able to find T2 and vice versa. So as long as I can get one of them, I can get the other one from this equation. Okay, so try to remember that because we're going to need that a little later. All right, but we're stuck. Sum of all forces equals zero only gets us um, as far as this equation, which for now is useless. So we're gonna have to write that the sum of all torques equals zero, okay? Previously, what we did is we just did this um, sum of all torques about the support point, but now we have multiple support points, and now we know that we can go beyond support points and really just pick anything, okay? So if you wanna find T1 or T2, the best thing to do is to write this at points one, um, let's call this point one, uh, let's call this point just in order here, two, three, and four, okay? The best thing to do this is to use points one or four. The reason being, if you write an equation for point one, the sum of all torques at point one equals zero, T1 is not going to show up in that equation, so you're gonna be able to solve for T2. And if you write the sum of all torques equals zero, for point T2 right here, then when you write the equation, T2 is gonna be zero, you're gonna be able to find T1, okay? But if you write it in the separate point, then if you write, let's say, the sum of all torques about this point here is zero, you're gonna have a T1 and a T2, you can still solve it, it's just more work, okay? So, we're going to say the sum of all torques about point one right here is zero. So think of this as the axis of rotation. I'm actually gonna redraw this. Here's the entire bar. I have T1 here, but it's not going to give us a torque. I have Mg here, which is at a distance. This is the R vector for Mg. It's at a distance. How far is, is Mg from the left? It's one meter. And then I have um, a distance to big Mg which is three meters. And then I have the distance to T2, T2 is here. The entire bar is 
Um, the entire bar is six, T2 is one meter from the edge. So this distance here is a is five meters, okay? So this guy will produce a torque that's in this direction, that's torque of little mg. This is the torque of big mg. They both are trying to spin this, they're pushing down, right? Both of them are pushing down, so they're trying to spin this this way, um, which is clockwise, therefore negative. And T2 is trying to spin this this way. Let me put this somewhere else. T2 is trying to spin it this way. Torque of T2 will be positive. They all have to cancel. So I'm going to write that torque of mg, negative, plus torque of big mg, negative, plus torque of T2, positive, equals zero. And then I can send both of these guys to the right side. And then I get that torque T2 equals torque mg plus torque big mg which should make sense. Again, all I'm saying is that all the torques going this way cancel with all the torques going this way. The next step is to expand this equation. So I'm gonna write that this is T2, whatever the R vector is, sine of theta equals mg, whatever the R vector, the length of the R vector is, sine of the angle plus big mg R vector sine of theta. I drew all three R vectors. Notice that in all of these, the R vectors are horizontal and the forces are vertical. So that means that all the angles will be 90 degrees, which is nice. This becomes a one, um, this becomes a one, this becomes a one. Okay, so what's the distance between the axes we picked and the axes we picked was one right here. What's the distance between that and T2? So it's the entire, well, most of the distance here, which is a five. Um, the distance to little mg is one, and to big mg is three, okay? One and three. So getting these distances right is obviously a key part of these problems. So five T2 equals one mg. The little m is eight. We're gonna use gravity as 10. Just to simplify, um, the big M is 12 and gravity is 10 and there's a three here for the distance. So when I plug all of this together, I have 80 plus 360, right? That's 120 times 360 and this is gonna be 440. So tension two will be 440 divided by five, um, 440 divided by five is 88. Cool, so T2 is 88 Newtons. Now that I have T2, remember I told you that as soon as you know T2, you're gonna be able to find T1, okay? And that's what we're gonna do here. So T1 plus 88 equals mg plus mg. Little m is eight, so eight plus 10. Big M is 12, so 12 times 10. Sorry, I said plus 10, it's times 10, obviously. Um, so T1 is going to be um, 80 plus 120 minus 88. So T1 will be 112, 112 Newtons. So here's my T1, 112, T2 is 88. Uh, is this all we wanted? Yep, that's all we wanted. Notice that T1 is bigger than T2. This should make sense because this mass here is closer to T1, right? Imagine instead that you are holding this here while your friend was holding this here, I'm making a mess here. Um, you would have to do, you have to have more force because this block is closer to you, okay? So it should make sense uh, that the tension one is greater, the tension one should be greater. So you can use that to sort of reason whether your answers are likely to be correct. These are the correct answers. I got 88 and 112. That's it for this one. Hopefully it made sense. Let me know if you have any questions and let's get going.